Hello, my name is Katrina Simon and I'm the Associate Dean for Landscape Architecture here at RMIT University. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the MLA orientation. And normally we'd be in the same room, but uh, in these current circumstances, it's still marvellous that we can actually communicate digitally. So I extend a very warm welcome to you. I'll just give you a very brief overview of where landscape architecture sits within our school and just a tiny bit of an introduction to my own work in landscape architecture. So we are in the RMIT School of Architecture and Urban Design. There are three disciplines within the school. Uh, the discipline of architecture and urban design, landscape architecture discipline, and interior design discipline. This is an overarching statement that we have for our discipline. It really, I guess, contextualizes a lot of the drive behind the work we do. Landscape architecture works with many of the things that people love the most. Plants, gardens, parks, plazas, seasons, rivers, coastlines, communities and memories to address many of the things that they fear the most. Climate change, environmental degradation, loss of the natural world, disruption, which we are experiencing a great deal at the moment, and drab uniform public spaces. The RMIT Landscape Architecture Discipline works across a range of creative ideas, living systems, physical materials and future possibilities in order to design significant, productive and workable spaces in which people and other living beings can live and flourish. And it deploys a range of innovative design methods and techniques to envision, investigate and propose better ways of living in a complex, uncertain and rapidly changing world. RMIT offers a professional design training in landscape architecture through the Bachelor of Landscape Architectural Design program, which is a three year program, and a professionally accredited Master of Landscape Architecture program, two years, which you are involved in right now. It also offers a Master of Disaster Design and Development in online and intensive mode for people wanting to transition their careers into the disaster management and humanitarian sectors. So just to give you a very tiny insight into some of the things that have inspired me working in landscape architecture. I have three particular areas of research interest, though I'm developing a fourth. Um, these would be cemeteries, cities and maps. And this image is Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, France. Um, it was a very significant new type of landscape, even though now to us it seems very traditional and in a way sets um, as a very recognisable type of landscape. But in its day, in the early 1800s, it was actually a new kind of landscape that was designed um, for burial in the city. And when I get, showed these slides last time, afterwards several people said, why a cemetery is interesting. And I guess I've just always found them an amazing, they're like a microcosm of the city, they're like a tiny version of the city. Um, they're incredibly varied um, and they're incredibly, often incredibly beautiful. And they tell stories of individuals, but also of larger societies. And over the time that I have done projects on cemeteries, both for competitions and through study and for other processes, um, I've really been interested in this question, which is how is memory embedded in urban landscapes and what happens when those landscapes change? Cemeteries change very rapidly. Almost as soon as they're established, they start to weather. And so this landscape that's built to perpetuate memory of people starts to, um, to change and, and decay itself. And so that changes the sense in which memory can be retained. This beautiful tombstone where the tiny uh, engraved letters gather water and the water then makes a condition for moss to grow. So it starts to almost become a new language. So for a long time, I was interested in this as a fairly abstract, almost theoretical interest. And then the city where I grew up, Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, experienced a series of very devastating earthquakes. They re really radically changed the urban fabric. Um, they disrupted every facet of social and human life and non-human life. Um, and now it's almost uh, nine years, so it's actually nearly 10 years since the uh, the first of these earthquakes, the, ex the earthquake sequence went for about two years, of thousands and thousands of aftershocks. And so in a way, this brought this interest in memory and how memory is embedded in landscapes much more to the fore. And it was actually something that a lot of people were talking about. And it became a real uh, issue for the city. How should the city keep changing, given all of these things that had happened to it? This is an aerial photograph taken from a drone 
of a part of the city that used to be a suburban area. It had individual houses, uh, each had their own garden. And this was an area of the city where the ground was so badly damaged. So it lost its strength and it started to behave like a liquid. And so a large area of um, about 500 hectares was de deemed to be uneconomic to repair in terms of the infrastructure. So those houses over a period of time were removed. The driveways were removed, the ground, the floor plates were removed, the fences were removed. And what is left is actually the gardens and the boundary planting. And so it's this extraordinary landscape that is at once very domestic and quite intimate and very familiar for anyone who's grown up in that kind of environment. But it's also vast. It goes on and you can walk for about um, for many, many, many kilometres um, in this slightly strange, um, not quite a garden, not quite a park, very unusual landscape. There's still a debate about exactly what will happen to this very, very large area of land in time. But it is in part being turned into a an extensive walkway that joins the central business district of Christchurch out to the sea. So it is becoming a new part of the landscape structure of the city. In response to this event, um, there was a design competition, an international design competition held for a memorial to the event, to the impact that it had on uh, people, not just the people who have died, but also uh, people's lives were completely changed. And it was also an opportunity to give um, recognition and thanks to people from the surrounding communities and other parts of the country and from around the world who uh, gave help and assistance in this time. So I um, joined a small team of uh, designers and we entered the design competition. I've entered lots of design competitions and I encourage you to do the same. They're fantastic. Uh, a really great way to exercise your design thoughts without necessarily having to have a job or a brief. You actually have something to respond to and you can say what you think would be fantastic. Um, in this case, we proposed, a, it was a project called Call and Response, which really spoke about this idea of people needing help and receiving it. Um, and that we tried to give that some spatial configuration with a grove of trees, a series of walls, and also a sound work and a bridge. That meant there was a whole sort of ceremonial um, and performative aspect to the way that this more, uh, memorial would operate. In the end, uh, we were in the top six, but we didn't win. Uh, so another project was actually built um, and be visited there if anyone goes. Uh, but it was still a great experience to be part of that. And again, it was another way of rethinking these ideas about how memory can and might be embedded uh, within landscapes as they change, continue to change. So just the last thing I'd like to leave you with is a thought about making and thinking. And that one of the things that really um, I guess sits behind a lot of what we do in design research is this idea that we actually think through making. That's our way of exploring ideas and generating possibilities. Um, so then the question I think becomes, what kinds of making will help us think about what we want to think about? And the more we make, the more thinking we are able to do. So really, I truly encourage you to embrace the possibilities of um, thinking through making as you are in design studios, make as much as you possibly can, make drawings, make models. We've seen some amazing uh, examples of people doing things in their very small apartments and kitchens uh, with unusual materials, really just to keep those ideas flowing. So I um, hope you have a wonderful uh, start to your studies and I look forward to getting to know you through those studies in the next few, few weeks and months and years. Many thanks. Okay, thanks for that, Katrina. Um, so we have here yet another welcome. Um, this time we're sort of welcoming you, I guess, to the sort of a roadmap of the next sort of two years of the master's program. Um, a master's program is a chance to take control over your own learning, to sort of pursue and develop your own individual interests within landscape architecture. Uh, no two students have the same path through the master's here um, for reasons that I'll get to in a minute. But in charting that path, um, you're able to sort of pursue learning at a higher level, to take courses that are asking you not just to learn, um, but to begin to kind of research and to develop new knowledge at that kind of postgraduate level that you're at now. So what we're going to do to sort of look at that roadmap 
over the next um, sort of two years. And in doing so, we're going to discuss um, the sort of strengths of the RMIT Landscape Architecture Program um, and also the sort of structure and the content of a lot of the courses that you're taking over the next through, uh, two years. So this is um, maybe normally quite a boring diagram and it essentially it is a study plan or a um, description of which course you take at which time. Um, but we're going to use it as a map. We're going to use it to see what it tells us about the program and how it works and try to look at the kind of bigger picture of what each of these uh, course names and course numbers represent. So um, at the start, we're down over sort of here. So we have um, both a mid-year entry and an end of year entry. And so we're starting off with this as our first semester, which is actually the second semester of the year. Then we're shifting over to first semester next year, then the second semester next year, and then the final semester, which would be the first semester of 2022. So um, we'll start by looking at your studio classes. So you should be enrolled in Studio 7 for this semester, and then you'll proceed to Studio 8 next semester. So these boxes are essentially double the size of the other boxes that we see up the top and up the bottom here. And that's because these studio courses are 24 credits. They're worth essentially twice the credit points of the other two classes, which means they have twice the amount of teaching and twice the amount of independent study expected. Um, and that is because we are a design-focused program, even compared to other landscape architecture programs. And we see design studios as the place where you apply all the other knowledge that you're learning from all the other courses that you're taking. That we learn about things like plants or landforms or digital tools because they ultimately help us design things better. So your design studios are where you will use those other knowledge from other courses um, and begin to explore design and the design process as its own form of knowledge, as its own thing that you can test and develop and sort of get better at and develop different approaches to. Each of our design studios are project-based, so you'll be given a sort of real site and a real brief to explore, and that project will be essentially a semester long, where you'll be developing a design over the course of 14 weeks um, for that site and for that brief. And at the same time as well, you'll be very engaged you know, with the realities of what is on the ground with these sites. But our briefs for Studio are sort of deliberately structured to be looking, I guess, both down and up in the sense that they're concerned with the immediate nature of the site and the brief that you're working in. But at the same time, they're looking at ways to explore these broader issues, issues about climate change or the growth of cities or how we understand sort of the role of technology within design practice. So at a master's level, um, a design studio is a place to work through both these big problems and these smaller problems, the problems that cut across many, if not most, or all of the projects you'll do in practice, as well as the, the problems that are related to the individual landscape you're working in and how those things are connected. So we're looking to sort of design um, or sort of use design to imagine not just a better landscape, but to understand these bigger issues within landscape architecture and within the world. Um, so what's also different or unique about design studios at RMIT is that they're all balloted and that they're all vertically integrated. So what vertically integrated means is that your studios are, or your classmates in your studios are not just um, other people who are starting the masters this semester. Um, what it means is that your classes are mixed. So you'll be working in studio with students who are one semester ahead of you in the masters. And you'll also be working with students who are one semester behind you in the final stages of the Bachelor of Landscape Architectural Design. So essentially these are classes or tutorials that are mixed between people at different stages of their degrees. Um, what we say when we say that studios are balloted is that um, a balloted design studio course is made up of a number of different design studios, um, design studio classes or design studio tutorials. So on the image are a number of posters from a collection of design studio classes. And this was the studios that ran um, at the end of 2019. 
So we had eight different studio classes or eight different studio um, tutorials that were all being offered as Design Studio 7 and Design Studio 8. So this is why we have these, this process of balloting um, is so that you can select which class or which tutorial um, you are interested in. So again, each of these um, images are posters that are advertising the particular studio tutorial. So they would say, um, here's what site this particular studio tutorial is working on. Here's our brief. Here's what we're going to learn. Um, here's why you'd be interested in learning that thing. And it's up to you then to choose or nominate amongst those options. So that's why um, we have balloting is essentially is that you're enrolled in the course, but once you're enrolled in the course, you still have a second choice, which is what studio in particular or what, what studio tutorial you wish to join for the semester. What this kind of means across the next couple of years is that you have essentially um, two opportunities through studio to develop areas of interest. So for example, in this semester, you might do a studio that focuses on ecology or focuses on how we design with water, while next semester you might choose to do a, um, a tutorial or a studio that focuses on sort of cities or how we might design new types of urban parks. So through the process of balloting and selecting your studio class, you have the ability to curate your own learning and to demonstrate mastery within a particular area and to learn from a tutor who is an expert in that particular area. After you finish Studio 7 and 8, so once you move into the second year of the program, um, you take on Project A and Project B. So these boxes are again uh, larger than the studio boxes. At this final year, um, these Project A and Project B courses, again, are worth more credits. Um, they take up essentially three quarters of your study load for the semester. Um, which is because they are essentially sort of thesis projects or major projects or capstone projects. So they ask a lot more of what you're doing um, and what you're kind of working towards. So um, this final year structure is something again that's relatively unique to the RMIT program that when you're going through project A and B um, you're developing an independent design research project. So within a studio, you're given a direction about what site, what brief you're working with, what kind of techniques or tools you're working with. In this final year, you have the chance to determine all of those things yourself and to do so over the course of essentially an entire academic year. So they're a chance to do in-depth, thorough research. Um, and they allow you to essentially um, sort of test and develop these particular interests or skills that will make you you um, unique as a landscape architect. That this is kind of the sum of your knowledge and you're able to kind of graduate having demonstrated your own particular interest within landscape architecture and to take that into practice um, and to actually begin to you know, develop the specialty that you might pursue um, before you graduate. And to be able to demonstrate to potential employers what those kind of unique interests are that make you, um, you know, special in their eyes, I guess. Uh, the other moving now just to the second of the first row of this diagram, these blue boxes here are the seminar courses. So each semester you do one seminar and you end up doing four in total. So again, there are sequence, they go one, two, three, four. You should be enrolled in seminar one this semester. So what seminars ask you to do is to investigate a subject through design, but they do so in a quite different way to studios. The kinds of designs that you do in a seminar are much sort of smaller projects and much more focused on one specific kind of question. Whereas in contrast, a studio asks you to explore and integrate many questions at once. So when you're designing for a real site with a real brief, you have many different questions you're trying to resolve holistically through what you're designing. In contrast, seminars are more free to kind of um, take a smaller chunk of um, that broader design process and explore it in depth by kind of isolating it. So for example, this is work from a seminar that asks students um, to understand how it is we draw maps as landscape architects and also how we can use maps 
to understand how these large big scale changes affect landscapes, things like say the effects of mining or the effects of ocean currents. So it's kind of looking at this very broad context to um, what we end up designing and how by understanding that broad context, we can design better at a smaller scale. These seminar courses like studios are also balloted and they're also vertically integrated. So when you're doing seminar one, your classmates might be doing their second or third or fourth seminar. So it's mixed between the entire um, master's cohort. Within each seminar or be, by being balloted, what that means is that like with studios, we have a series of seminars that are on offer each semester and they each have their own sort of individual um, class with their own individual brief and their own individual kind of learning agenda. So essentially that we ballot for studios and for seminars. So you have two different sets of choices about which studio class do I want to do this semester and which seminar class do I want to do this semester. And so seminars in particular, because you do four of them, are a great chance to build up different areas of expertise um, within the design process. Moving on, the next course we have is called Professional Practice. So that's only in the second semester of each year. So you basically have to do that in the second semester if you're planning on sort of finishing in a full semester. So Professional Practice is where you essentially learn um, many of the professional skills of landscape architects, particularly those that are related to um, sort of producing documentation according to professional codes, how to manage and administer professional projects from the kind of perspective of project management and sort of construction law and liability, and also how to sort of start and run a landscape architecture sort of company or landscape architectural practice. So it's focused on essentially um, how design or how the practice of design intersects with essentially the law, with different disciplines, um, and with these kind of governing regulations that um, both govern what we can construct, but even the kind of softer forms of regulations like drawing standards that also govern the way in which you design in different ways. What we would then move to next semester is an elective. So essentially the elective means that you can do any other course at a postgraduate level with um, across RMIT. So RMIT has a tool called the Elective Finder, and that essentially lets you search for electives that are on offer. So you might search for an elective, you might say be interested in learning GIS, and you might find a course called uh, GIS 1368, and you could find that and then enroll into that for the course um, for that next semester next year. Um, what you can also do is enroll in the Landscape Architecture Elective. So we offer a number of electives as the Landscape Architecture Program that you can take, um, or you can take an elective across um, the broader university. I guess maybe the tricky thing or the crucial thing to note here is that if you're doing the Landscape Architecture Elective, you would be using this ARC 1364, um, sorry, 1363, course code, um, but if you're doing any other lands any other elective across RMIT, it will essentially have a different course code. So that's just something to keep maybe keep in the back of your mind, um, is that there's essentially two different ways to play this. One is doing one of our own electives, in which case you enroll in that. And in the other case where you're finding an elective to do, you'll need to find the actual course code to change your enrollment. Because by default, you might be already enrolled in that one when you actually want to do whatever this one ends up being. So almost done. Um, we're trying to keep things short um, while we're doing online video. I realize this is not as exciting as perhaps YouTube or something else. Um, so we'll kind of keep things moving. Just a couple of small notes. Um, it's important to maybe double check your electives, sorry, your enrollments this semester and to check that they essentially look like this. Um, so that if they are not looking like that, maybe get in touch with me, send me an email, I can help you out there as well. But essentially your progress throughout the masters and um, in order to complete everything in two years, then you know pretty much every course for each semester needs to happen at that particular time. So that's why these this enrollment structure is worth uh, kind of running through as well. 
if you do unenroll or essentially are doing a part-time load, um, that's, you know, you have a lot more kind of flexibility there to keep, um, to kind of pick and choose where things might be. But even then there's a couple of considerations like where exactly you fit in professional practice. Um, because certainly by your second year, you actually have not a lot of space for courses apart from project A and B. Okay, so that's enough on the courses. Um, this is a slide with the coordinators of different um, courses across um, the program. So some of the ones that I've just been talking about. So for example, um, Yazid is the coordinator of the studios across um, the master's program. Bridget is the coordinator of the seminars. A uh, little bit cut off de there down the bottom is Charles, who is the coordinator for project A and B in the second year. And then Fiona Harrison, who's the coordinator for the electives that you'll take next semester. So you'll get to know these people, um, hopefully in person next year, um, but also through sort of emails and Canvas announcements and things. So essentially, if you have questions about the seminars or essentially um, anything specific to your seminars, you can uh, find their emails or send them a message on Canvas and things like that. Um, whereas I'm sort of more of a point of contact for general um, things across the masters, whether that's enrollment changes and things of that nature. Um, so maybe there's a couple of things worth noting here as well. There's a couple of other sort of uh, like parallel opportunities that we offer to students as options within um, their studies. So the first one are exchanges, is that if you're interested in going on a semester long exchange overseas um, in the future, that's something that we offer. We have a few different places where we have established exchanges. If you're interested in doing that, say in the first semester next year, send me an email and we can sort of see how things go. Um, generally, each of the things I'll talk about on this page need to be done in the first year of your masters. So the second thing we do are internships. So we have a number of established internship partners, um, EMF and STOS, which are in Spain and um, Boston respectively. And we also have a number of um, internship partners within uh, Melbourne, within Australia and within New Zealand. So we have some sort of more local options and some more international options. Um, and so what happens when you go on an internship is that it's essentially a um, full-time study load. So when you are on an internship placement, you are doing that in place of your normal semester study. So what that means going back is that when you're, if you complete an internship, you essentially get credit for a seminar and a studio. So what that means is you might go to Stoss, um, you might work there for three, four months. That would essentially be your entire semester. And then you would um, come back and receive credit for a studio and a seminar worth. So essentially what that means is you can complete an internship um, without slowing down your progress through the masters, but also you can complete an internship um, and actually have it be you know, a full-time thing that you're immersed in rather than say be a one um, day a week kind of setup. The other thing we offer is Curb. Curb is a um, journal of landscape architecture that students at RMIT have produced now for about 25 years running. So it's a internationally renowned um, journal that has a very long history, very kind of prestigious track record, and it's entirely produced by students. So in the first semester of next year, they'll put out the call for people to apply to be part of CURB from across the bachelors and the masters. And again, like the studio, if you're doing Curb, it would sort of replace your studio and seminar. And so you'd be able to work on that and get credit for it as kind of your main thing that you're doing that semester. So obviously putting together a journal is a lot of work. Um, that's a, it covers things like the um, putting out the call for articles, doing editing, understanding and selecting the abstracts, doing the graphic design, managing the print production process. There's a lot of things um, that go into doing it. But if you're interested in um, sort of writing and publishing, particularly on the kind of academic side of things, it's a really great opportunity. 
Um, yeah, so maybe there's a few more details. We have a, um, what are some of our local internships, uh, people like Aspect as well. There are a few other things that we'll run through quickly. Um, we have a student staff consultative committee, which is essentially a, um, uh, like a forum or a discussion group between staff and between students to kind of discuss, discuss um, anything related to the program. We also have a student landscape architecture body, which is essentially a student organized club for landscape architecture students. And they hold, a, they run a number of events, they run a number of kind of um, support groups and kind of uh, collective learning events as well. So actually we'll hear from them in a second. Um, we do a number of public lectures and public workshops um, as a program as well that are open to essentially anyone across any level of the bachelor's or the master's. Um, so this is where we'd normally introduce some of the student administration team who um, are in the design hub and available to help you with various queries about enrollments and things. Um, they're now essentially working from home like um, most other people at RMIT. And so essentially when you're using RMIT Connect or talking to the AUD help team, um, they would be talking to you directly. But hopefully you can meet them in person uh, next year as well. What we'll also introduce here is AILA Fresh. Um, so for context, AILA is the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects. And AILA is the, um, they're kind of the professional body that is responsible for um, managing and promoting landscape architecture in Australia. So when you become an official landscape architect, um, they're the people who kind of accredit you and who manage that process. They also do um, advocacy for the importance of landscape architecture. They do a lot of professional development and offer a lot of services to um, members or people who are landscape architects. And so within AILA is a group called Fresh or AILA Fresh. And so AILA Fresh is a kind of subgroup of AILA and they're designed to support people who are on their way to becoming landscape architects. So that includes students like yourself, recent graduates and so on. So essentially they're for you. Um, so they host a number of professional uh, kind of events or events that say are networking events or social events that um, mix together recent graduates, current students and experienced practitioners. So often this will take the form of going to a local office to see a talk, usually by someone at that office about an exciting project they're working on and then having um, some sort of drinks or food as well to kind of discuss um, sort of what you saw and to sort of ask questions about the practice that you're at. Um, they also run a kind of formal mentorship or kind of meeting program. So this is kind of like a structured networking event um, where you're able to kind of quickly ask questions to a variety of different people by kind of almost shuffling around them over the course of an evening, which is a lot of fun. And they also run an, a, a sort of official longer term paired mentoring program. So this pairs students um, with landscape architects and other practitioners for a kind of more structured chance to meet, have kind of longer conversations about how to sort of pursue landscape architecture, you know, what the world of practice is like and all these different questions. So this fresh program ran over March to July. So it's not gonna run again until March, July in 2020. Um, but I'm just kind of putting it in, again in the back of your head now. It's something to watch out for when it rolls around again. Um, cool. So they have social media pages that you should go check out. Uh, it's vfresh underscore Ayla on Instagram and you can just search it on Facebook. So they'll post details of those upcoming events. Um, the second group that I talked about before is the Student Landscape Architecture Body. So they're essentially um, a group or they're kind of the representative group of landscape students. So they are themselves all landscape architecture students across both the bachelors and the masters. They run a number of different social events and kind of workshops and symposiums. Um, they're actually running a competition right now that ran over the mid semester break in partnership with uh, Vic Trams. Um, so if you check their social media, which we'll um, show in a minute, um, you can see the results of that in a couple of weeks. Um, and so that social media is at RMIT Slab on Instagram and so on. So um, I think you can join up online and also follow along with what they're hosting. So they also do 
um, I think regular kind of drop-in Zoom events over the course of um, last semester. And I'll imagine they'll be doing so in this next semester as well. Um, the student staff consultative committee, I'll be sending an email around about that in a couple of weeks. Um, so we can um, broach that then. Um, this is normally where someone would, from the library would talk to you. Um, I think because the library isn't open physically, we can skip through a bit and say that um, the library has a number of online research tools, a sort of vast and growing number of their catalog is now digitized as eBooks. And then there are obviously things like journals and other sources of academic writing um, that have been digitized for a long time. So while we can't go to the library this semester, um, at least not in the next month or so, um, there is plenty of opportunity to still engage with the library uh, online. They also have a number of sort of assistance programs for um, essentially how to do various aspects of research that are available as lot, um, online as well, where they would normally be um, an in-person service. And it's also worth noting one of the things the library offers is access to lynda.com, which is now called LinkedIn Learning. But essentially, this is a very, very vast collection of online videos that will allow you to kind of upskill in any number of different software programs. So we're not going to be teaching things like AutoCAD in class, um, but if you're interested in skilling up on AutoCAD, lynda.com has uh, literally, I think, thousands of hours at this point of content about how to learn different software. And so these are some other library services that are available that um, teach things like research skills and narrow down um, sort of various journals and databases by subject. Cool, so what we'll end with is essentially the next thing you have to do, and that's to do the balloting process. Um, so I'm gonna kind of give you an illustration of what that looks like. So essentially today, um, what we're gonna do, what you'll do after this is you can go to Canvas. So hopefully you have links to Canvas already. If not, it's um, rmit.in structure.com. I mean, I'm sure you've already seen Canvas or you've got plenty of emails from Canvas already, but essentially when you go there and you log in, you should have a Canvas page for your studio, a Canvas page for your seminar, and a Canvas page for your um, for professional practice. And so those are Canvas pages for everyone who's enrolled in those courses, Studio 7 and Studio 8 along with seminars one, two, three, and four. And so today, um, a series of videos will be posted onto those canvases, which essentially advertise the different tutorial options available for this semester, or the different you know, seminars or studios that you can select from. Those canvases will also post a link to a web form that you would fill out online and essentially nominate which of those studios you would like to um, join. And then on Monday, you'll um, receive an email that tells you essentially which seminar or studio you are allocated to, and also um, what the time and location of those classes are. So in this case, the location's all gonna be on Canvas. We generally run classes through an online meeting tool that is in Canvas itself. Um, but Monday will confirm which particular seminar you were allocated to and when they are sort of first meeting. So none of the meetings will be on Monday itself, so you don't have to worry about that. But it, to sort of illustrate this process, essentially um, the studios or seminars will look a little bit like this. It'll probably look a little bit different. This is the one from last semester. They'll provide a link to a form. That form will take you to a website that looks like this. And then as you move through this form, you'll be able to select your different preferences for um, seminar. So seminars and studios have limited space. If everyone wanted to do one studio or one seminar, they couldn't. You know, we have standard class sizes that we don't go ahead or go above. So we essentially have a ranked choice of voting or ranked choice of preferences. And then we try and distribute everyone so they get at least their first, second, or third preference out of the set. 
Cool, and so also on um, the form or where you came from on Canvas, there'll be these posters and videos that describe um, the what you'll be learning that semester if you're selected for that seminar or for that studio. It's worth noting maybe that this form is not um, first in, first serve. You don't have to do it fast, but you do have to do it before Friday morning. So you have essentially all of Wednesday and all of Thursday to nominate your preferences. And then after that, um, if you haven't submitted it, we'll kind of just decide things randomly for you. So you can take some time, you can read and view the videos, um, but just be aware that you, it's, this could be aware that there is a deadline um, and that's essentially midnight Thursday. So do remember to do it, um, otherwise um, you'll sort of miss out on getting to choose or shape which option you'd like. All right, so here's unfortunately we would normally do a tour of the campus. Um, again, as I mentioned at the start, we will um, be doing that next semester with any luck. So essentially when we um, everyone's able to be back in the same place, we'll do kind of a second iteration of orientation that will be in person and we'll be able to kind of meet each other and to kind of meet the spaces that we're learning in. But yeah, again, hopefully this video has answered some of your questions, given you an idea of where we're going over the next two years. Um, if you do have any more questions, feel free to send me an email, let me know. I'm happy to do um, answer queries over email or do a quick kind of um, Skype or WeChat um, as well, if that'd be easier. So um, welcome again for the last time. Um, and I hope to see you and your work over the next semester. Bye.